Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church. My name is Annalise Stevens Jennings, and I am the new associate pastor here at Braddock Street. And I am wonderfully honored to be here with you all this morning. And I am not here alone today. I am here with Pastor Kirk and our amazing team of musicians and tech folks who make sure that this worship service can happen online. And we are so thankful for all of their hard work. Here at Braddock Street, we make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world by loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and loving our neighbors in service in our community. We hope that while you are with us online today, you will like the stream and you comment and you will share and we hope that you will uh, share your prayer requests with us. I will be with you online um, taking note of those so that we can pray for each other by name later in the service. Now would you please join with me in the call to worship. Do not plan harm against your neighbor who lives trustingly beside you. Do not quarrel with anyone without cause when no harm has been done to you. Do not envy the violent and do not choose any of their ways. And now please join me in our opening prayer. Holy, loving, compassionate one, you have given us your beloved son, the Prince of Peace, yet we have rejected him and his way of love. Teach us again that the power of love is greater than the power of coercion, conflict, violence, and even death. By the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us to be faithful to your way of peace and love in the world, filled with division and hatred. In the name of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, amen. And now please join with me as we worship together through music.
Good morning. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here. And I just want to say thank you to Bill Baber and Emily Benkin uh, for sharing in music this morning. This morning's scripture comes to us from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. And now we're going to worship God through our offering. Uh, You see on the screen the different ways that you can do that. You can donate right there on the Facebook page. You can text to give. You can visit our church's website. Of course, you can send your donations in through the week uh, by snail mail, as we call it. And I want to remind all of us, if you're not worshiping uh, with your home church, if you're worshiping with us here at Braddock Street uh, because your church is not offering worship in any fashion, please Remember your home church, uh, and we're all in this together. And now let us continue as we make our offering to worship God through music. Again, we are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Today, we begin a new worship series called Three Simple Rules. It's based on a book by the Bishop uh, Reuben Job, which is written about John Wesley's Three Simple Rules for the Methodist Societies. We'll get into that in a moment, but right now, let us pray. Holy Spirit, make us aware of your presence here in our homes or wherever we find ourselves this morning. Let us know that you're right here with us and open our hearts to hear about your rule of love in the world and how we can do that much more faithfully. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Three simple rules. The first that we will deal with today is called do no harm. And as I think about that topic, my brain goes back to a YouTube video that our former associate, Sean Devilite, shared with me. It's, it's put on by uh, Honest Preacher. And this pastor comes into his congregation, and there they all, all gathered, and they're waiting for, to hear what he has to say. And he just immediately breaks down with a heavy sigh and screams, guys, stop it. And he begins to go through the different ways in which they are uh, unfaithful and they do horrible things and he just his message is stop it and every now and then Sean and I would walk down the hall and he would look at me and just stop it right it seems that simple that doing no harm might be things that are within our control that we can control our own actions and our own speech and before we dig into it too in too much depth where does this come from? For those of you that were not raised United Methodist or maybe you're new to Christianity in general, um, our founder in Methodism was a fellow by the name of John Wesley. And for you Methodist nerds, uh, you can go to paragraph 104 of the Book of Discipline and you will find there John Wesley's general rules for the Methodist societies. And many of us raise our eyebrows and go, what, what are societies? Well, before there were Methodist churches, remember John Wesley was a priest of the Church of England. He started a reform movement within that church called Methodism, and they would organize the societies. And here in the colonies, before there was a United States, episodes like this took place. I know about this one because I was pastor at Stephen City United Methodist Church years ago, and so I read their history. And the way it happened was this. Two Methodist preachers, traveling preachers, they weren't even ordained, but they went to visit the community, which at that time was called Newtown, and they visited the Stevens home, for which Stevens City is named. Mr. Stevens was not present, so they discussed it with Mrs. Stevens that they wanted to have a preaching service the following day. Would she be kind enough to just spread the word around the community? So many people in the community showed up. It was a new thing in the frontier to have a preacher come to visit the community. So these Methodist preachers preached, stayed a night or two, and people who wanted to form a, a community of believers, they did so. And it was called a Methodist society because there were no churches. They didn't have a building. It was just getting started. And the preachers would come around years after you know, just once every couple of months. It was not a pastor-driven religious movement. It was a lay-led religious movement, and that's when Methodism was really on fire, spreading like wildfire throughout the area. So a society was formed. Here's how Wesley de defined a society. A company of people having the form and seeking the power of godliness, united in order to pray together, to receive the word of exhortation, and to watch over one another in love, that they may help each other work out their salvation. Now, you know if the society becomes large enough, you can't really watch over everybody in love or, or get to know exactly what's going on in their life. So the societies were divided into things called classes. It's where we get our Sunday school classes from or our small groups. What we're doing as we encourage all of us here at Braddock Street Church to be engaged in small groups, it's nothing new. It's the very heart of Methodist Christianity. Wesley said, there are about 12 persons in a class, one of whom is styled the leader. To see, he is, it is his duty to see each person in his class once a week at least in order to inquire how their souls prosper. The classic question was, how is it with your soul? The leader is to advise, reprove, comfort, or exhort as occasion may inquire, to meet with the ministers once a week to inform the ministers of any are sick, or get this, or of any that walk disorderly and will not be reproved, right? It was a small group where you could hold one another accountable and grow in your Christian faith. And Wesley said, it is therefore expected of all who continue therein that they should continue to evidence their desire of salvation. First, and here's where those general rules come in, First, by doing no harm. Later, we'll talk about by doing good. And lastly, 
by staying in love with God, as Reuben Job phrases it, as Wesley said, by attending to all the ordinances of God. Today we'll just focus on by doing no harm. And I just want to share with you a few of the things that Wesley thought were important as examples of doing no harm. It meant not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain, not to profane the name of the Lord, drunkenness, slaveholding was mentioned by John Wesley, also buying or selling slaves, fighting, this one I found amusing, the, the using of many words in buying or selling, the buying or selling of goods that have not paid the duty, in other words, they weren't paying taxes, charging unlawful interest, doing unto others other than a way that you would have them do unto us, and so forth and so on. Wesley has his list of ways that we should do no harm. And it sounds fairly simple, that these are things that we can refrain from doing. When you take that to the extreme, really, you could just sit on your hands, right, and not do anything. But as I thought about doing no harm, I realized very quickly, why is it then that we do no harm? And I realized the complexity of the evil that exists in the world and the way it enters into us in ways that we know and somebody just needs to tell us to stop it, but also in ways that we're not aware of. It's complicated. For example, each of us who become Christian in our baptismal vows, we say that we will, we will resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. So that can be going shopping, buying a t-shirt. And what do you do when you buy a t-shirt or anything else? Typically, you buy the one that costs the less. But what if that t-shirt is less expensive because the owner, the manufacturing owner of the property practices human trafficking and uses child slaves to produce that t-shirt? It's our responsibility once we educate ourselves and become aware to no longer participate in doing business with such people. Another simple rule is thou shalt not kill. It sounds simple. None of us, you know, want to kill anyone. And yet, I will never forget a story from a dear friend of mine, a model Christian. And he told me on a Sunday morning in late October of 1962, he was in the United States Air Force. And he went to Post Chapel at Lawson, Larson Air Force Base in the state of Washington where he was stationed. And he said it was the oddest thing as I sat and I listened to lessons like love your neighbor, worshiping a loving God while at any moment the siren could go off and I would jump in my B-52. It was the Cuban Missile Crisis. I would drop nuclear warheads on innocent people. Thou shalt not kill. Even that can be complicated. This sometimes haunts me. I remember being in seminary and there was this image on a faculty member's door. And it was right across the hall. I'm not even remembering what the class was that I was taking. I remember that the door was open very often, and in those moments where my mind began to wander, I would look across the hall. The professor's name is Stanley Hirewas. He's one of the greatest Christian ethicists of the 21st century, of the 20th century, excuse me. And this poster was on his door. If you can't read it, it simply says, let the Christians of the world agree that they will not kill each other. And I would read those words and I think, how easy is that? And then comes war, right? Can the Christians agree that our allegiance to God is more important than our allegiance to our own nation? Can we agree to that? Because if we can't, then American Christians at that time would be involved in killing Serbian Christians? Couldn't we Christians talk and work things out so that we would not participate? Because there are Christians in every country, right? There are Palestinian Christians, Iranian Christians, Iraqi Christians, Egyptian. We can go all around the world and find Christians there. Could we not agree with one another that we won't kill each other? But you and I know it's just not that simple. It's hard. Doing no harm is hard. Most of us are not put in those moments of devastating reality where perhaps thousands of lives are at stake. For most of us, it's the way you and I relate to one another and to our neighbor on a daily basis. And it's in those moments of conflict where we 
perhaps don't do our best. Reuben Job writes, when we agree that we will not harm those with whom we disagree, conversation, dialogue, and discovery of new insight become possible, right? There's a great opportunity to resolve conflict if we refuse not to pay, to participate in the evil. It's based on the idea of turning the other cheek, that we take that first step not to respond in kind, to repay evil with evil. It's beyond fairness. It's beyond equity. It's beyond justice to the point of compassion and mercy because that's the Christian ethic, that we go beyond what the world says is fair. In other words, as Gandhi put it, you know, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. So as I pondered doing no harm and how complex it it is, I thought maybe it would be helpful if we looked at some of the reasons that we find ourselves doing harm. Of course, in the first instance, when we encounter evil, our tendency, our human nature is to react, to respond in kind. Reuben Job suggests we we do that because we lack self-discipline and we lack a complete trust in God's leadership, that God's going to take care of this. We feel like we need to be in control. We don't completely trust God to do it. And we feel like we've got to do something. We've got to do something now. But is doing nothing a way of doing no harm? Sometimes it is. But there are also moments where silence can be a way of doing harm. Because when evil presents itself, if we don't name it, if we don't call it out for what it is, then we allow it to grow, to have more power. For example, some people today are calling COVID-19 the Chinese flu or the the Kung flu. And we're already seeing Americans in this country who are of Asian descent having to suffer violence for people who now want to blame this pandemic on Asians. We have to call it out. Or for another example, the police who stood by and watched Derek Chauvin continue to put his knee on George Floyd's neck. I don't know the particulars of the case, but you know in that instance, if we remain silent, then we participate in the evil. We give it the space to thrive and bring harm on others. But most of us are not in a position where we can hold authorities accountable. Most of us encounter evil approaching us in more subtle ways, in more personal relationships. Let me talk to the white folks for just a minute. You know what I'm talking about. When somebody tells a racist joke or makes a racist statement in your presence, you're probably like me. I get so shocked, I don't know what to say. I literally, I'm in that moment of, I can't believe I just heard that. Or maybe somebody tells a joke and and you're like, do I really want to go there right now? Do I really want to bring this up? This is family or these are friends. Do I really want to upset the apple cart? And I would encourage us, those of us who have experienced that, and you know it's probably going to happen again, to think ahead of time. What's an appropriate way that we can name racist attitudes so that they're not given space to thrive? Maybe a phrase like, I'm sorry, but that's not okay. Maybe a phrase like, that's not appropriate. Or you're offending me, even. Think about whatever that phrase is that that you can come up with ahead of time so that you're ready. Because if you're like me, in in the heat of the moment, I, I can't think of the right word to say. Another way that we inadvertently do harm is based out of ignorance. We just didn't know. I love humor. I love to tell a joke. Um, but I find that given cultural differences and those kinds of things, very often it's not funny to somebody. I used to tease people, you know, it was a way when I was young of, of sharing a certain way of affection, you know, I've got quirks, you've got quirks, let's, let's have a little fun with that. And I'll never forget the day, and I still regret this day, I'm going to tell a story on myself. I was teasing a young lady because she had this quirky little way that she walked. We were teenagers, you know. I should have known better, I don't want to give myself an excuse, now I know better but I still regret it. I used to tease her about the way she walked until one day she blew up at me and let me know that the reason she walked the way she did was because of a medical condition. 
and I just felt so small. I had unknowingly done harm to somebody that I cared about. The reason I tell that story on myself is I think that's where most of us are. We don't intend to do harm, but sometimes we do it out of ignorance. It's out of the not knowing that we do harm for others. I hear people today talk about, well, so-and-so is just being politically correct, and, and, and it irks me a little bit. Because PC, we even use the acronym, right? And we belittle it. Like, using politically correct language is a bad thing. In fact, what it's doing is being polite. What's the alternative? Being incorrect? Heightening assumptions that we have that are wrong? We need to listen. We need to talk to the source. How do you feel about that? One such conversation I had years ago was with a friend of mine named Frank. We used to play touch football together, you know? I found out Frank, much later I found out he was Native American, full-blooded, Mattapanai. And I'd always been a Washington Redskins fan. Still am. I mean back from when they traded this guy named Norm Sneed to get another quarterback known as Sonny Jurgensen. I'm old, and I've been a Redskin fan for a long time. I love tradition. I love sports traditions. But I had to ask my friend, friend Frank before I, you know, blurted out something. I said, Frank, I'm a Redskins fan. Tell me, what do you think of that? What do you think of that team name? And it was just an honest conversation between friends. Frank's Native American. He doesn't speak for all Native Americans. He doesn't speak for his own tribe. He was just sharing with me his opinion. And he said, you know, I get it. Redskins, it's a team name. Nobody really uses that name anymore. It was the N-word, right, for my culture. But I get it that nobody intends to do harm. That part doesn't bother me so much. He said, you know what bothers me? He said that people treat us as though we only existed in history, you know, with the feathers and the teepees and, you know, they act like we're not here anymore. What I want to tell you is just by acknowledging that I was ignorant and I wanted to know more and I opened that door for conversation, Frank, helped to open my eyes of what it's like to be Native American in this country. It's like we don't exist. Nobody knows that we're here, even though we were here first, right? We can do no harm by not knowing. And we know in the pandemic, now we know more than we used to. We've learned that by social distancing, wearing masks, right? It's about preventing the spread of the virus. Now 40 to 45% of people who get COVID-19 will never experience any symptoms. We might have the virus and never know it. So when we wear a mask, it's not about protecting ourselves. It's about protecting our neighbors. It's an expression of doing no harm. Worshiping here online and only offering online worship, it's a way that we're trying to do no harm to stop the spread of the virus. If we do what the experts tell us, we can slow it down or perhaps even stop it, and then we can all get back to work together as soon as we possibly can. But it's more about saving lives, right? Doing no harm. Doing no harm. The text that Reuben Job chose, Galatians 5, here in verse 14, it's about loving your neighbor, right? Expressing your love. And the key verse is, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The great commandment, of course, love God and love neighbor. And here Galatians singles it down to, in a way, say, expressing our love for our neighbor is our supreme expression of our love for God. Now, those of you who have been around me, you know I'm just enough of a heretic to argue with the Bible. And I do this just for a subtle point. Because Jesus gave us another verse. In John chapter 13, beginning with the 34th verse, he says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Yes, love your neighbor. And he goes on to say, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Not just love our neighbor as ourselves, but love our neighbor in a more pointed way, in a more specific way. In the way that Jesus Christ has loved us, he loves us sacrificially. He gives his life for us. He looks at each one of us as a child of God, worthy of God's almighty love. 
So it's even more specific than love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what we do. We often do harm because we want to put restrictions on who our neighbor is. We weren't the first. Here in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus tells a very, very famous story. But I want you to look at the setup. Look at why Jesus tells this story. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Don't we all have that question? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He's not just any lawyer. He's a religious lawyer. His job, his life is dedicated to interpreting the religious law for others. How do you read, Jesus is saying. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Many of us think Jesus invented the great commandment. No, it was already a part of the Jewish tradition. And here this lawyer knows it, and he can state it. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. That should have been the end of the conversation. He got the right answer. But you know lawyers... You know, humans, we all like to rationalize. Wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That, what follows, the answer to that question is the story of the Good Samaritan. It's not so much a story about what we're supposed to do when our neighbor's in need. It's a story about race. It's a story about culture. It's a story about We cannot put restrictions on who our neighbor is. Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't care. The Samaritan is portrayed as the hero of the story. And the Samaritan was the one that his mom, the lawyer's mama, and even the religious law said he was not supposed to have any contact with that person. So he was in effect saying, such people are not my neighbor. But Jesus knew his heart as he knows our heart. And he wanted to say to him, and he wants to say to us, there are no restrictions on who our neighbor is. I am amazed that some people don't realize Jesus wasn't white. And he loves me. Jesus doesn't know borders. We care a great deal about borders. We fight wars over borders. We develop immigration policies about borders. And Jesus doesn't care. He just looks at another human being and says, I'll die for you. Can we love one another as Jesus Christ loves us? There's a beautiful story from the Jewish tradition about a rabbi, which literally means teacher, a rabbi teaching his class, and he asks them a question, when can you tell when the dawn is breaking? And one of the students raises his hand and he says, is it in the morning and there's enough light that when you look at an animal, you can tell whether or not it's a fox or a dog? And the rabbi says, no, that's not when the dawn is breaking. And another student suggests, is it when you walk by an orchard in the morning and there's enough light where you can tell the difference between an apple tree and a pear tree? And the rabbi says, no, that's not when the dawn is breaking. And they all became frustrated as they offered these different possibilities And they said, go ahead then, tell us. And he says, the rabbi says, the dawn is breaking when you can look at a man or a woman and know that he or she is your brother or your sister. Until you can do that, no matter what time it is, it is always night. Can we look at our neighbor without restriction and see Christ? Perhaps that will help us to do no harm. Let us pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us without restriction. Thank you for loving us with our our flaws and our mistakes. By the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to love our neighbor with their flaws with their mistakes, with the unintended harm that they may have done to us. Holy God, as we look in the face of our neighbor, may we see that divine spark, which is your Holy Spirit, 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now continue to worship and meditate in silence. Please continue in prayer with me. Holy One, we offer you all of our praise, and we love you. Thank you for all that you have given us, and help us to share what we have been given with others. We confess that saying that we will do our best to do no harm is really difficult and we don't always get it right. And we are so thankful for your grace, knowing that you cover us with your love and your mercy so that we can try again tomorrow or in the next minute or in the next hour to learn how to do no harm. We pray for all of those around the country who are figuring out how to reopen things safely, including our team here, and ask that as people are thinking about how to go back to school, to go back to work, or those who are already there and those who never got to stop, that you would keep us safe, that you would help us to remember how to keep each other safe and keep the love of others in the forefront of our minds whenever we step out of our homes so that we can keep each other safe. We here at Braddock Street have these names to lift to you today. Kathy Ritter, Sarah Hudson, Stephanie McWorther, John Goodlow, Mike Ricketts, Wayne Dick, the family of George Floyd, the family of Muriel Renner, the, oh, sorry, Adrian O'Connor, George Morris, Robbie Robinson, Dick Harmison, George Quarles, Denny Bromley, Wendell Dick, the family of Breonna Taylor, the family of Ahmaud Arbery, Andy Chapman, Roger Murphy, the Fiddler family, Danette and Penny Hayes, Laurie's brother Tom, Jeff Haig, Steve Corbett, Katie Teets, the family of Justin Angel, Harold Ogg, Lynn Owens. We also pray today for the first responders, grocery workers, truckers, delivery drivers, and all of the medical staff and everyone who works in healthcare, especially at our Valley Health System. And Lord, we pray all of these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now would you join with me in singing our next hymn. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you to our technicians and our music folks who helped make this possible. And know that we are continuing to let people in our community know that we are Christian. By the love that we share as we collect food for bright futures, we're continuing to do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are here feeding the hungry and serving in any way that we can. Go now, at the very least, to do no harm. And go with the blessing of God the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.